good morning once again, everybody. It is so good to see everyone. Congratulations once again for getting up early and being here. Give yourself a big hand. All right. They say the early bird gets the anointing. That's what they say. So you guys are going to be the anointed ones. And so I want to welcome everybody once again. My name is Eric Bucci, lead pastor here. Uh, we have three services. Uh, we change the service times a little bit. You guys are the 815 crowd. Okay, 815 train, all right? And then we have the second service is 945. And the third one, because they don't like change, they're going to stay at 1130, okay? That's what's going on. Also, everybody, listen, we have a prayer team that prays. If you have any prayer concerns or prayer requests, please, you can pull one of these cards out and put it in the back, and we will be praying for you. Or if you want to see one of the pastors here or talk to somebody, you can do that. Or if it's your first time here, if you could fill this out, if you're first time here or if you've not been here in a long time, after the service, if you go to the front information desk out front, we have a brand new car for you if you hand us in. Now, we have a gift for you. No, no, not a brand new car. We have a gift for you to say thank you for being here. So all you got to do is go and, and hand that in because you're important to us. You really are. You know why you're important? Because God loves you so much. And we, we just know that God has good plans for you and us and all the objectives that we would come to know God. That's our whole objective. We would know God. We would find the freedom that he has for us. We'd discover the reason why we're alive. And then we'd make a difference in the world. And God has chosen you and me. You're custom made by God to make a difference. So that's what's going on with that. Also, everybody, I uh, just want to rem remind everybody, we have something called a Seder dinner. If you know what that is, uh, basically it's a Passover. And so the Passover is a really powerful opportunity to see how Jesus is foreshadowed in the Passover. And so we're going to have a Passover Seder dinner. I, uh, I think it's the 19th, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? 31st. 31st. Okay, 31st. Thank you so much for helping me out. The 31st, I should write down my notes, 31st of, of, uh, of this month on a Friday night. Today is the last day you can register after the service because we have to, you know, get the, all the meals prepared and all that kind of thing. It's going to be a great, great, great time. And finally, uh, another thing I want to mention to everybody is that we're going to have, for Easter, we're going to have five uh, worship opportunities for people. We might even have to add one, depending what happens. We're going to ask you to register online because our parking lot is not large enough, and it's kind of hard. We want to make sure we regulate correctly. And if you guys could do us a big, big favor, here's what's going to happen on Easter Saturday. It's going to be at 3 o'clock and 4.30 p.m., and then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, the normal times, the new normal times, A15, 9.45 and 11.30. And so we want to encourage you, most people who do not know Christ want to come on Easter Sunday. But the spiritual ones like to come on Saturday. Now, if you can make us more room, that'd be great. We want you to invite someone to come to Cornerstone Church for Easter Sunday. People will come to you if you invite them. We want to encourage you to do that and ask them which one they want to go to. We got five services. Which one do you want to go to? Saturday at 3 or 4.30 p.m.? Or do you want to go on Sunday and ask them where they want to go? Whatever they want to go, you go to that one. But if possible, if we can make more room and distribute ourselves better, we're believing God for 1,500 people or more to show up for Easter. So we're, we're looking forward to reach more people for that. It's going to be a wonderful time where we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through, through song, through worship, and that's what's going on. Also, at the end of our service today, we're going to have our time for our offerings, tithes and offerings, and we have a matching uh, challenge right now. Whatever you give towards the relief in Turkey through um, Convoy of Hope, we will match up to $20,000. So we want to encourage you to get involved with that. We want to make a difference what's going on in Turkey after the earthquake and the, the thousands of people that died from that, okay? All right, we're concluding our sermon series on habits that lead to a habitat of holiness. We've been going through this whole process of how do we grow in Christ? How do we stay clean? How do we grow in strength and power? And remember, we've been talking about we want to create an environment around us where what controls us is not the outside environment, but the environment of heaven, that we've created a greenhouse, if you will, and we have these habits that are strongholds. Habits are like walls. Habit creates a habitat of holiness for Christ. So we have these holy habits. And holiness, by, by the way, is being whole. 
That's what holiness really means. It means set apart for God. And when you and I are set apart for God, we're so much better than we could be without, ours, without that. So today what we're going to be talking about is how to share your faith. But before I do that, I, I heard of a story of these two different pastors on two different sides of the street. And they would compete against each other. There was a Catholic priest and a Protestant uh, Episcopalian on this side. And they always put signs out and try to outdo each other. One day, they're out there putting, holding signs saying, turn before it's too late. Another one, the, the Catholic guy says, the end is near. And so they're putting these things out, and these cars are driving by and say, you stupid religious nuts, what's the matter with you? We also hear, splash. And someone drove off a bridge. And the Catholic priest said to the Protestant priest, you think we should have said bridges out? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, what, what happens when there is a bridge that, I remember a number of years ago, there was a bridge out in an interstate in New York. And it, it came out and, and the driver saw it and stopped the vehicle and got out and was waving frantically to try to stop the people from going. And like, you crazy nut, and one drove to their death. You see, we have a responsibility to tell people what's going on out there. What's the situation taking place? In fact, it says in Ezekiel 33, 6, but if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he's responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. And so what basically that's talking about in the Old Testament had watchmen on the wall and that their job was to watch to make sure when the enemy came, they would tell people about the enemy coming. Well, my friends, you and I are called watchmen. We're called, you're here for a reason, to let people know that one day they're going to have to face God. And it's our responsibility in cooperation with the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ to share the good news. Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. And so we're supposed to tell people about Christ. And, and if you're like me, like, well, gee, I'm not quite sure how to do that. Uh, I don't know how I'm supposed to share my faith with other people. And let me propose to you, we shared last week, we gave you some reasons why, and we showed Schindler's List at the end, that everything we do in this life matters for eternity, and people matter. And Christ has sent us to continue on. So it's our responsibility. It says in Ezekiel 22:30, I look for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I search for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I found no one. God wants us to stand in the gap, to intercede, to pray for our country, not to curse our country, to be a blessing to those that are around us. God is looking for people to stand in the gap. The problem is we often fall into the gap. We fall into the gap of the world. We get caught up in materialism. We get caught up with our phones. We get caught up being distracted by many things. And we lose our purpose, and we lose the reason why we're alive. And what happens is we end up running after, our, running after things and positions and let the world get us drunk with materialism and trying to be somebody and, and matching up to your next-door neighbor. They're moving to Florida. I'm moving to Florida. They're going here. I'm going here. We try to match up. We try to be happy. We try have a good retirement there's nothing wrong with those things within themselves but we can get so caught up not doing bad things but doing things that distract us from our purpose what God has called us to do he's called us to make a difference in the world you see this is what Jesus tells us to do he says to them after he rose again from the dead this is what Jesus said he says go into all the world and preach that's right preach tell the news preach the good news which by the way good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead, right? Preach the good news to everyone, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. And it means baptized, it means, what that simply means is they've given their life to Jesus Christ. So we have a responsibility to tell people what's going to happen. I don't want to get to the end of my life and, and realize that I made a mistake. For example, on, April, on December 7th, 1941, about 3.20 a.m., there, there was a person in, in Hawaii, and they, they saw in their periscope, they saw some kind of submarine. Ah, that's no big deal. It's probably a false thing. And that was the day of Pearl Harbor. And the person did not tell them what was going to happen. 
My friends, you and I have a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ because everyone's going to have to face, meet God one day and give an account for their life. And God loves us so much that he sent Jesus, and so this is what it's all about. So we share our faith. We mentioned last week, I'm just reviewing. We share our faith because it's our design and it's our calling. It's our design and our calling. The first thing is, also we mentioned that heaven and hell are real. Heaven's a real place. Hell's a real place. God does not want anyone to go to hell. That's why he sent Jesus. And Jesus paid for our sins, and we have to put our faith in him. Heaven and hell are real. And real living is sharing the gospel. When you and I start doing what God created us to do, it brings us, you come alive. Your life begins to have meaning beyond yourself. You see, I think most of us, how many can remember times where maybe you've done something nice for somebody? Maybe you did something in secret. Maybe you gave money to somebody, no one knew about it, or you helped someone in need, no one knew about it. How did it make you feel inside? You felt good, right? It's like, ah, this feels great. Why? Because you did it without any other motivation but to help somebody in the name of the Lord. And the reason it feels so good, that's what we're created to do. When we give to, to be seen by others, it's different. But when you give selflessly to somebody else, it brings such a joy and a hope and a peace that you cannot get anywhere else. And the reason being is you're designed by God for that. So really, everybody, how you and I can break out of the doldrums of just living our life is when we start doing what God's called us to do, God's going to infuse you with the spirit of adventure. You're going to find your life a lot more worth living. Why? Because you and I are designed to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. The problem is we're, we're kind of calloused by materialism, by distraction. It begins to happen to us. This is what Jesus said when he called his disciples. He said the following. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you consumers of wealth and entertainment. No. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They were fishermen. He says, I'm going to make you a fishers of men. So that's why Jesus has sent us to be a courier of those things. Now, I, I look at this. I'm going to ask you guys an honest question here today, okay? Here's a gauge. Apathetic or passionate? Love for people without Christ. How much love do we have for those who don't know Christ? If, and that's between you and God right now. I'm going to ask you a question. Where are you in the scale? Ten is your passionate. I mean, you're just ready to go to wherever and share the gospel. Or one's like, I really don't know. And I have a sneaky suspicion that many of us are probably in this area here. Because why? It's easy to fall there. It's easy to get there because we have a narcissistic society. These things are, are just helping perpetuate that. Where I, I have to be actually put these things away now when I'm going out because I find if I'm on this reading books or even doing good things, I don't see the people around me and I can't see what God is doing around me because I'm in my own little orbit. I'm in my own little world. And, and I'll be home and I'll read it and I'll go, shh, shh, tell my kids, shh, shh, so I can read an article. And so what happens is we get caught up in this and we get caught up in our little world and I think the enemy is really happy with that. If he can't get us to sin, he'll get us distracted. If he gets us distracted, we're not able to do what God's called us to do. But we're called for a purpose and a reason. We're not just here to get saved to go to heaven. We're here to bring heaven to earth. And Christ has called us to do that. And if we're not careful, we can get apathetic to what God would call us to be and do. And this is what can happen, everybody. I'm going to ask you, where are you on that scale? I want to be at a 10. I can't honestly say right now that I'm where I need to be. I want to be at a higher level because Christ came. He so loved the world for people. And you're like, well, I really don't care about this. But this is our job description. And the good news is this. If you spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ, not out of obligation, but out of a relationship, and you spend time in the Word and you worship God, God will begin to change your heart. When you step out on faith and begin to share your, your faith, you'll start getting more passion for it. And the more you do it, the more you'll be on fire for Christ until you're like, wow, this is what I'm called to do. And this is the good news. Jesus says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every, every um, nation, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I am with you until the end of the age. Christ is, no more, is more with us in his manifest presence is when we're sharing the faith. And this is where we can find God because it's God's heartbeat. And I know sometimes you may be apathetic to it, but my friends, we cannot listen to our emotions. We have to let truth 
dictate our emotions. I want my emotions to reflect the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of the United States or my own self. And we have to be careful. We have to train ourselves for righteousness. This is not legalism. This is loving God. This is what we want to be able to do. So Jesus told them again. Peace told his disciples after he rose again from the dead. Just before he ascended into heaven, he said this. Peace to you. As the Father sends me, so I send you. We are the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. And this is what Christ would have us to do. Now, look what Jesus talks about. This is the reason Christ has come. He says the following. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. Do you see a lot of stealing, killing, and destroying going on? Yeah. You see people losing their marriages, losing their life, involved with addiction, involved with war, involved with fighting, involved with partisan nonsense, and people don't like each other. All that hatred, all that frustration, all the shootings, all the kind of shooting off people's mouths and domestic violence, you name it, divorce, all this kind of stuff that happens is a result of a fallen nature. So what happens is if he comes except to steal, kill, and destroy, and he asks, he tells us, I'm going to give you good things. But he, he delivers the opposite. But I have come, it's Jesus, that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. You see, God wants you to have an abundant life. The abundant life, however, is not what Madison Avenue or what the advertising agencies talk about. No, abundant life is knowing God, passionately knowing him and fulfilling what he's called in your life. That is the most abundant life that you can have. This is why you'll find that when you're serving God, you find yourself at the most abundance you could possibly have. But you kind of have to shave off the calluses of your heart, and so do I. You see, abundant life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. This is what God would have for us. Now, how do you share the hope you have? How do I share it? First of all, I don't even care. So why should I share? I know, I mean, if we're really honest here today, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. How many don't even care? No one would say that, but maybe you're struggling with that a little bit. And that's okay. Tell God, God, frankly, I don't care. I wish I cared. I don't. I lost that loving feeling for people. And, and what does Jesus tell us in, in Revelation? I have this one thing against you. You lost your first love. You do everything right, but you lost your first love. So what I want to encourage you to do is to fall more in love with Jesus. It's the greatest thing you can do. Don't try to evangelize without going after God first. What will, what will burn your heart for Christ is knowing Christ. Because the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. When you delight yourself in God, your desires become his desires. And then all of a sudden, you want to share your faith with other people. And you find it. So how many, you know what I'm talking about? When you start doing the right thing, it feels so good. And that's not the reason we do it. It's just showing us that our design is for that. We want to share the hope that we have. Look at 1 Peter says in 3, 15, 16. This is what we've got to do. Here's what Peter talks about. All right, the apostle Peter. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Now here's what we're called to do, everybody. Okay, this is the scriptures. Always, what does always mean? Thank you. Always be prepared like a good boy scout and girl scout. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. And some of you are really good at giving answers to everyone who asks. Well, that's a different answer. But always be ready to answer everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And we should have a hope. When you're going through something and someone died, you know, I, I lost this person and I'm, I'm really distressed by it, but I know that God is with me. I've seen people that have gone through cancer and through all kinds of difficulties and people ask him, why do you have such peace? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. God is with me. He's my healer. Whether he heals me now or on the other side, I have peace. People go, how do you have that peace, right? So you can share the hope that you have. But do this with arrogance and lack of respect. Is that what it says? Well, right now, if someone disagrees with you, you cancel them, right? That's how our culture has gotten so horrible. Both sides, and both sides of whatever side you're on, have you noticed? 
if, I don't, if you don't agree with me, I hate you. You hate me. It's horrible. It says, do this with gentleness and respect. You're going to hell. <laughs> Are you clearing your throat? What's the deal with that? How's that going to help me? Now, I'll, 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 I'll tell you this, though. God uses all types of means to reach all types of people. There have been people on the street corner of New York City in Times Square. I've heard stories. Actually, I knew a guy that the guy was screaming at the top of his lungs, return, you're going to hell. And that scared him, and he gave his life to Christ. So it can work. But generally speaking, how well do you do when people yell at you? Friend! I mean, you like that, friend? Okay, thank you. I woke three or four, <laughs> I woke three or four of you up. And friend's like, stop it, pastor. And her husband's like, don't you mess with my wife. Okay, but what, I mean, how is that going to help by yelling? Uh, how about, how many of you like when you're growing up as kids, when your parents nag you? Clean your bed, get the get dishes. How many of you like that? I don't know about you, but I get, more, I, I get more rebellious. Thank you. Can I hear an amen? Come on, that's not very good. You should, you should be subject to the people in authority over you. You sin, no, I'm just kidding. But it happens to me. Even today, my wife goes, clean the dishes. I'm like, no way. But since I'm a godly man, honey, I love you so much. I see how hard you work around the house and how you take care of the children, how you love Jesus. And so I, it, I'm so happy to lend my hand to bequeath to you my affection by cleaning the dishes. And then she comes down, she worships me. It's wonderful. Yeah. But let's be honest, we don't, like to, we don't like to be nagged, right? No one likes to be nagged. No one, even God hates nagging. There's, four, there's a whole generation of people that didn't go to the promised land because they were nagging. God hates nagging. One time Moses and God were talking, God says, leave me alone. I take these people out. He said, no, no, God, please, please, please don't do it. It's like parents on vacation when the kids are whining in the back seat. I will we do it. And, you're like, and, and by the seventh hour, you're like... <laughs> You start getting twitches and ticks and all that, okay? So no one likes to be nagged. So why should we nag people? We don't want to do that. We want to tell them, listen, I'm really concerned for you, what you're going through right now. And you don't say it like, I'm better. I'm, no, we're not better than anybody else. We've been saved by grace, right? Not of yourself, lest anyone can boast. So we got to be careful about that. We're not... Okay, so we have to be humble, right? And, and give a reason for the hope you have with gentleness and respect. Because guess why? Everyone's made in the image of God. Even the people you don't like. The people that are diametrically opposed to everything, even a Satanist, is made in the image of God. We should show them with respect. You're made in the image of God. And I will show you respect and I will be gentle with you. It's important. It says in 1 Peter, keeping a clear conscience. So don't be angry, everybody, you know? Don't be angry so that those who speak maliciously against your, your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed. You know, I can't, I can't talk, you know, they really are nice people. We want to be known for that. It's important. So what we want to be able to do when we, we talk to someone, we want to find common ground, not a battleground. Right now, our culture is about a battleground. We want to find common ground, right? We want to find, uh, most people want to be happy. Most people want a life full, uh, not full of pain. Most people want a life of meaning. Well, can we all have those human conditions? Find what they like. What the Apostle Paul says is very clear. He says this. He says, to the weak, I became weak. To, uh, to win the weak, I become all things to all people that by all possible means, I might save them. So Jesus became one of us to reach us, right? So what we want to do is find common ground with people. I want to find common ground, and that's what we want to be able to do. In fact, look what, G look what Apostle Paul says. Apostle Paul went to a place in Athens, Greece, and he was talking to people that were very learned, the upper echelon, the, I guess the Princeton or Oxford uni University or the Yale University types and professors. They had this place called Mars Hill, and it would be like a, a place where they would uh, tell different ideas, and people would listen, and they would smoke the proverbial academic pipes. They didn't have pipes, but you know what I'm saying. They liked the, all the academia and all that. And so Paul goes... And talks to these people, says the following. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, 
I notice that you're very religious in every way. For I was walking along and I saw that m- many of your shrines. He says, I see your shrines. And he talks to them. And one of your altars had this inscription, to the unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He found common ground. Okay? He didn't tell them the four spiritual law. He found common ground with them. We want to find common ground. We, okay? We're going to move forward because we're, we're running a little low on time here. Okay? So I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to get to the end of my life and have something to speak for. Uh, some of us have gotten involved with the stock market, <laughs> and I know people that have, got, have retired and like, I have to go back to work because my portfolio went way down. You're, ROI, return on investment, right? I want to make my, sure my life is matters to something. Well, I don't know about you. I want a return on eternal investment is so much better than a temporary return on investment. Because the Bible says, do not store for yourself treasures on earth, right? But treasures in heaven. And every time we reach someone for Christ, we are storing for riches in heaven. Every time you do something for God and not yourself in love, you are having riches in heaven. And one day God will reward you. I want a return on eternal investments. That's why we're having an offering for Turkey, because what's going to happen is the local churches in that area are going to help the victims of the earthquake. And in the name of the Lord, they'll help them out. This is how we do it. We want a return on investment. And so with fees break in and, and all that, wherever your treasure is, there's a desire of your heart. So when you and I give our treasure, our time, and our talent, God begins to move in our heart. Now, how to share Christ. Here, I want to show you, everybody. You want to take these notes down, or we can have them for you later. These are some of the scriptures I, I encourage you to be familiar with to help you in this process, okay? Here's the problem. The problem is, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen short of God's glory, okay? For the wages of sin is death. We talked about that. You don't, it, your sin will take you in a death march, okay? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the problem. What's the solution? Because we're all full of sinners, right? All of us, every one of us. What's the solution? Here's the solution. But God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, while we weren't even looking for him, Christ died for us. He made a way when we weren't even looking for a way, Christ died for us. We share that one. Jesus answered and said the following, I am the way. He does, he does not provide a way. He is the way. Jesus is the way. He is the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What about people and places that never hear about it? I don't know what's going to happen to them, except they're going to have to go through Jesus. The only assurance of salvation is through Jesus. And the reason it matters is that Jesus has us go to the earth, all through the earth, and spread the gospel. I don't tell people who's going to hell and heaven. That's God's job. My job is to spread the good news and say that Christ is the only way. Because truth matters. And Jesus is truth. And there is salvation in no one else. The Bible is very clear about that. There's no other name under heaven given among men under which we must be saved. So the problem, the solution, and what's the response? Here's the response. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, gave them the right to become children of God. So we can share these scriptures with people. You can memorize them. And by the way, we'll talk more about this in a few moments. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. For it is within your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith that you are saved. And finally, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, anyone, anyone, I will come in and dine with him and him with me. So this is the the way, those are the scriptures of it. Now, what's the manner of of evangelism. How do we do it in the proper way? Listen, everybody, you don't have to be a theologian. Evangelism is sharing the good news. So let me break it down real simple. You know what evangelism, you know what evangelism really is for us? Okay, I like what William Lane said. Successful evangelism involves not only harvesting, but sowing, right, and watering too. We must never think that because a non-believer remained unconvinced by our case that our apologetic has failed, our sharing of Christ has failed. 
For one encounter is not the end of the story. Most of us came to Christ in process. Maybe your job is to throw some seed. Maybe your job is to say something, and it will haunt them until later on they give their life to Christ. So, manner of evangelism, first thing you want to do is pray for them. Pray, God, give me a heart for the lost, number one. Number two, here's another one. Be nice. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> it's just, I'm serious. Some of the jerkiest people I know are Christians. We're angry at everybody. Be nice. Jesus met the woman at the well. He gave her self-respect. Give me something to drink, please. She says, you a Jew? Talking to me, a Samaritan woman? Yeah, sure. He starts talking to her. Gives her self-respect. Finds common ground, but getting something to drink. The next thing you know, the relationship starts talking. And then he asks her some questions. And he finds a way in to share. So pray for them. Be nice. That's all you have to do. Be nice to people. Here's another one. Consistency in your rhythms. And this is something I'm working on right now. And I could share with you a story. What happens is sometimes maybe choose a certain coffee shop every day or wherever you go or go to a certain laundromat or go to a certain place every day and say, Lord, who are you working on here? And maybe go to the grocery store the same time every week. And you can start asking God, or how about you take out your trash the same, you know that next door neighbor takes out the same, go out there the same time. Ah, how about this trash? Yeah, it's trash, isn't it? Yeah, it's such a trash. <laughs> the world's so trashy. It is, but Jesus came to clean up. What? Okay. So maybe find somebody, and, and I'm telling you, and what happens, we have to put these things away and look around and say, God, what are you doing around me? I could share stories with you, but because we're low on time, I can't. But find a rhythm of your life, okay? Consistent rhythm in your life. And that what begins to happen, you begin to notice people. You go to maybe the same place or you go to the same restaurant or you go to the same coffee machine at work or you take a break the same time and you begin to ask God, what are you doing around me? And God is always working around somebody and, and, and God's looking for someone to stand in the gap and maybe you're the person that can do that. Pray for spiritual conversations. Man, I don't know. I'm really worried about my mother. What's going on? I don't know, but she just got a diagnosis. Would you mind if I prayed for your mom? Would you? Yeah, I, we believe that Jesus hears our prayers. You open a spiritual conversation, okay? And finally, invite them to church or invite them. Invite them to come. By the way, we have these cards as, we, as the worship team makes their way back up. We have these cards all in for Easter. I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you to write down five people that you want to invite to church. 80% of the people you ask to come to church with you, according to the research of George Barner, will come for Easter. So fill out five of them, okay? To fill out five of these, take a picture of it, and hand it in today, one of the boxes, and we're going to have a prayer team to join in prayer with you. Studies show that 88% of people personally invited to attend Easter will come. Get involved. If you could do that. Could you guys do that? I think, do we have these cards here today? I think we have them as we leave. Take a picture of it and put it in the box. We want to be praying for people over this time. We want to be able to do that, okay? But here it is, everybody. Oh, there it is. Boy, they fit right in there. I mean, okay. <laughs> but you, look at your neighbor say, you are you. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people from his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has us here for a reason. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this opportunity today. Lord, to come here today. Lord, I recognize this is not necessarily a kind of message that we would gravitate towards because it's asking us to give instead of receiving. But Lord, we thank you that it's in giving that we truly receive. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would make us more of a people, starting with me, God, that we would share the faith for the hope that we have. Lord, we're praying for Easter that we would see, Lord, I'm believing hundreds of people could come to know you because we're sharing the gospel. And we thank you, Father God, we don't do the work, we just share. And your Holy Spirit does the work. So, Lord, I pray you bless us right now, Lord. Give us a hunger and a thirst for you, God. Give us a passion for people who don't know you, Jesus. 
Oh, Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours, God. Father, we confess that we don't care like we should. But, Father, we want to care. So, Lord, we want to step out in faith and begin to pray. We want to be nice to people. We want to pray for a spiritual conversation. We want to begin to share our faith in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you absolutely positively know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus Christ? You can know that today. Not because of your good works, because of what Christ has done for us. Christ is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. It's like someone saying, I want to go to, I want to, go to England. You can't get to England unless you're on a boat or an airplane. And what you want to do is not just believe in an airplane. That's fine. But you need to get a ticket. And you get a ticket is provided for you by Jesus. And what he asks you to do is take that ticket. He asks you to hand it to the flight attendant and then put your faith by walking onto the fuselage of the plane, putting your full weight and throwing your entire life into that fuselage of the plane where it can take you where you need to go. Well, Christ is that. You must be willing to lay down your life and say, I'm not God, he's God. And I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. With every head bowed and every eye closed, somebody would say, Pastor, today I want to go completely, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. I want to renew my commitment because I've fallen away and I want to get right. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone else? Okay, let's pray this prayer. Can we pray it out loud together? Here we go. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins and rose again from the dead. Today, I put my trust in you. I believe you are Jesus. I believe you're the Messiah. I believe that you are God. I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to step down from being God. You are God, and I am not. I submit my life to you.